Hey everybody, it's your buddy Beard Grizzly, and I have to stop you right there. This is part two of a multi-part event, so if you haven't seen part one of the nine yet, you can click in the top right eye to get to the first video right now. In the first video in this series, we covered the legends of the nine, and how they seemingly love to play games. Today, however, we're looking into another group of individuals in Destiny that also love to play games. This rabbit hole is a pretty steep one, but I hope by the end you guys will understand where I'm coming from. There's no fun in any of this if I can't speculate to my heart's content, and last I checked, you guys kind of enjoy hearing my crazy theories. I'm going to leave the skull of Dyer Ahamkara up on screen, which is where we stopped last time, so give it a read if you'd like. Pause the video if we go too fast, or you can't listen and read at the same time. Trust me, I know I generally can't. A lot of newer information we seem to be presented with in Destiny 2 seems to be more visual than written. I think that's somewhat fair to say when ghost scans are like, this crystal, this crate, this banner, you get the point. Obviously this isn't always the case, but it does serve to show a few things right off the bat. You know, like us going to a singularity to apparently take place in this nonsense. But hold it. You're gonna tell me that we're fighting in or around and visiting a black hole? Let's take a step back here. The closest possible black hole, and please note I said possible because this can change in the next minute we talk, is in a system called V616 Monoceratus. This system is about 3300 light years away and currently consists of a K-type star, or a smaller dwarf star, and another region that is, to paraphrase NASA, a stellar mass that cannot be a star. Now, keep in mind, we don't know the status of the star that circles this black hole, and for all we know, if we entered that system, it would actually be completely gone. 3300 light years roughly translates to 19 quadrillion miles away, and it takes about 3300 years for that object's light and activity to reach us here on Earth. To some, that's obvious, but for those needing a small idea on how light years work, that's the basic gist. When you look up at the night sky, you may literally be seeing ghosts. You could thank William Herschel for that image. Okay, solar masses and light years aside, what does that mean for us? If you played Destiny before, you'll be rather familiar with the mission Restoration. I mean, it is the first mission after you go out to the Cosmodrome. Here you pick up an NLS drive. If you're not familiar with the shorthand, NLS stands for Near Light Speed, and this means we're not quite able to travel at the speed of light. Well, obviously you'll wonder what the speed of light is, which is roughly 671 million miles per hour, but the math and data is completely near moot if near light speed is the fastest we can get to within space travel and destiny. Just to quickly stomp on the idea of the Golden Age possibly having something faster, the colonists that were on board any colony ships were put into some kind of stasis. They were gearing up for a pretty long trip. In case you're wondering about what we have in the City Age, however, there are some hints that we've improved NLS drives. They aren't released yet, but sitting in the database are two items, a standard NLS drive and a finely tuned one. I'm led to believe that these are the same drives that may go into our ships, which tells me that's still as fast as we can go, which means light speed or faster is unattainable for our guardians. So getting back to the black hole, how the heck are we able to see this thing? This is one of two things, a complete oversight on Bungie's part, giving us an area in space we shouldn't be able to access safely without it affecting our solar system, or it's not there. Let's take this from another direction. The closest star system to us is Proxima Centauri at about 4.2 light years away. Assuming we can't go faster than the speed of light, this could still take us over five years to get to this location. This also assumes that something happened that pushed Proxima into some kind of supernova, which may not even cause a black hole, and that's just, well, our star is going to give out before Proxima does, we'll put it that way. Five years without our guardian within the solar system, with Ikora at the very least, wondering where the heck we've gone, not being able to sense us or communicate with us, you know she or Cade would at least be mildly concerned. And that's just to get there, not to get back. That's a 10 year round trip. I hope this is making some kind of sense, but the long story short here is 
there shouldn't be a black hole that close to us. Aside from very few instances, black holes are small and usually very dormant out in open space unless they are acted upon in some manner. Without some kind of matter to suck up into the black hole, there's no reason for this thing to be active and clearly, there's a lot of star junk hanging around. Now, with the forces we know of in Destiny, I won't discount the idea that there could be something acting upon a star or dormant black hole, but the possibilities in known science are very low. Black holes can be tracked, albeit not easily, through x-rays. For all of this to make a bit more sense, we have to look at what the Ahamkara seem to be. Ahamkara are fascinating and awesome creatures within Destiny's lore, but sadly we've never seen one, at least so we think. I mean, they're friggin' dragons, could we at least see one of them, please? Part of this may have to do with one of the signature forces that Ahamkara seem to utilize, which is manipulation of the mind. As the skull of Dyer Ahamkara seems to suggest, they plant thoughts and illusion into your head, making you question what you might see, feel, experience, but they also have powers that are highly sought after, usually in the category of adding an extra grenade or melee attack, granting extra of something else to the wielder of their items. And those are just their bones. I'll read off an old grimoire card about the great Ahamkara hunts if you're not familiar, and you'll pick up on what I mean almost immediately. After great deliberation, it was determined that the Ahamkara be made extinct. It was not an easy decision. Power had been obtained from the bargains, and the city needed power. Knowledge had been gleaned, and the Ahamkara knew answers to questions no one had known to ask. But the price was too high, and no edict or forbearance seemed to stop guardians from seeking them out, driven by hope or vengeance or despair. The call had to be silenced, so the Great Hunt did its work. And thus the Ahamkara were made extinct, their call silenced, their solipsistic flatteries erased, their great design, if it ever existed, broken. Of this you can be assured, O oh reader mine. The last line is a common phrase for the Ahamkara, O oh reader mine, O oh bearer mine. Any variation on this phrase is generally questioned as being related to either the worm gods of the hive or an Ahamkara. During these hunts, hunters and warlocks seem to be very proficient in killing them. However, Shaxx and Zavala apparently took one down as well back in the day through some dialogue that Zavala tells us in a strike. Danger is a natural habitat for ghosts and their guardians. If you need some motivation, I can tell you about the time Lord Shaxx and I hunted an Ahamkara. The last line of this grimoire card also serves to show that maybe, just maybe, the Ahamkara didn't all die out. With the level of manipulation they may possess and making us think by sheer suggestion that we killed every Ahamkara, that's pretty impressive, to say the least. I mentioned it in our last episode, but to reiterate the Long Tomorrow 9G, some of them survived. I know a fellow says he saw a wish dragon on Jupiter a ways back. Again, wish dragon is often thought to be compared to that of the Ahamkara. This manipulation seems to carry over into a few other aspects of the main focus of this series, however, and that's the Nine. Zur is one of the prime reasons I want to call this level of manipulation a question and to question the power that the Ahamkara may have. Zur is seemingly controlled by something, or at least has some level of controlled consciousness. I don't think that can be argued at all. One of his famous quotes, I do not entirely control my movements. Again, he has some level of control to do what he wishes, but overall, Zur is a puppet. For better or worse, he also likes to bring a lot of Ahamkara-laced goodies along with him, and wow, we really did have a lot of them back in Destiny, didn't we? We still have a few that came over into Destiny 2, but most of them don't really tell us much else from what they did before, minus being able to acquire Ahamkara bones through some resellers. Maybe Zur is to blame for that. Silly tentacle face. Further, Zur is a gathering of dead cells, and though I need to discuss this at another time, it does make me wonder what else may have the ability to act upon dead cells with the information we're presented with thus far in Destiny's lore. I would also very much argue that your teammates and opponents within the Trials of the Nine are simple illusion, while there you sit in your ship, flying about for a few hours. Then what about the gear that we're handed? Well, Ahamkara were called Wish Dragons. It's just a theory, but I'm going with the possibility that they could 
fabricate this gear from engrams, glimmer, or otherwise. I'm just saying, there's loads of gear that we still don't have an idea where it comes from. Read over the Faux Tracer, for example, a helmet that looks familiar, but was modified. I thought I was dead. Held my own for a bit, but I could hear the wizard wasn't alone and she'd be coming for whoever took out her spawn. It was just lying there, honestly. Looked like a standard old Outrider kit, but it had this rig, enough small diamond conduits to make me think it was something pulled out of those old Bray Labs in the MNP. I don't just go putting things on my head, but I was desperate. Not sure what activated the thing, but sure enough, there she was. I already had a lock on her, and once I engaged, there was nowhere she could hide. You might be thinking I'm suggesting the Nine, then, are Ahamkara. I'm not. In fact, I don't necessarily think any of the beings we've seen are the Nine, or even of little ones we've heard of so far, but that's for another time. There's one other major thing that seems true of the Ahamkara, and it's that they seem to be able to traverse the Void, very similarly to that of the Traveler. Questions exist thanks to Ghost Fragment Warlock whether the Ahamkara were brought about to life by the Travelers terraforming on Venus, or if they existed before. Parts of the Books of Sorrow suggest they may have lived before the Traveler arrived in our solar system, but either case puts them in a prime position to be used by the Nine for this mind-warping property that they seem to hold. The gear that we have consisting of Ahamkara bones focuses on the subclasses that use void and solar light, and this seems to further this concept of understanding void energies and rifts. If they are, in fact, around Jupiter, then this places them in line to be around Europa and in a key position to work with the Awoken, especially if there are any of them traversing that flux tube we talked about earlier. Or they could just be fabricating nonsense. The Third Spire itself is a questionable area, built around this strange contraption that looks like something Dr. Manhattan would have made up. Looking outward, there's no sign of the black hole space we saw before. There's no sign of the deep black that we fly into. There is light, a sun, planets. This space simply shouldn't be here. The black hole simply shouldn't be here. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up, and it's the largest question of the trials I have so far. The manipulations of the Ahamkara just line up with what we're seeing here, quite possibly. Anyway, I can ramble on and on about the Ahamkara, but I think I'll cut it there. Not a lot makes sense with the space we travel to, and I would think twice about trusting that unknown space you enter. All you're doing, by my logic and current, is placing yourself at risk of falling prey to an Ahamkara, just like the Guardians of old. After all, the city is still worried about them. Consensus Meeting 3234.43 Zavala, Guardian Ariadne Gris, have you had contact with an Ahamkara? Ariadne Gris, no. New Monarchy, then why does your sparrow bear a dragon logo? Ariadne, because dragons are cool. New Monarchy, if Ms. Gris won't take this seriously, Kate 6 play nice, Ari. Ideo's knickers are really tight today. Ariadne, I thought a dragon would look cool in my sparrow. Not all dragons are Ahamkaras. Zavala, Ikora, your perspective? Ikora Ray, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Are we really still talking about this? Dead Orbit, <laughs> muffled laughter. Ikora Ray, obviously Gris has not had contact with an Ahamkara. FWC, how do you know? Ikora, if she had, she'd win SRL more often. Ariadne, harsh, Ray. Zavala, then let the record show. The consensus's official stance on the Dennis Emerus dragon symbol is cool. A not so clear result of whether the Ahamkara hunts were, in fact, a success, wouldn't you say? If you too thought this was cool, or maybe not cool, you know the buttons to press to let me know your thoughts quickly on this summation of the possible links with the Nine and the Ahamkara. If you're not sure what to say, you can always leave the phrase, O oh, viewer mine, and since I just said that, I know you'll subscribe as well. Nah, I'm kidding, your viewership is more than enough for me, and I appreciate it to no end. If nothing else, I'll see you next space time, Guardians. Next up is the Emissary and Zur. We're far from done with this trip down the rabbit hole that is the Nine. Take care.